Through the years I thought I found you But nothing would do Now here we Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Spore the Warning podcast. This is review number 739 with a review of Past Lives. I'm Christopher Schneezy. And I'm Stephen Miller. And if you're joining us for the first time, the Spore the Warning podcast is a weekly film review program. Each week in the show, we're going to dive in, debate, discuss, and argue over the latest films coming to a theater near you. This week, we already had a review of Disney Pixar's Elemental. We had a review of Asteroid City. And now we're coming together for a review of Past Lives. Um... This is a film I think we've both been uh, both both been anticipating. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, definitely. I think we both knew about it from Sundance, and then neither of us were able to catch it yeah. virtually during Sundance. Yeah, and then a trailer came out, and we're like, "Oh man, this is coming." We'll be wait. wait is this the one? Is it, this is the one that was they did an A twenty four screening room for, and like every other A twenty four screening room, we were like, "This is going to be here." by the end of the week available on iTunes or something like that. And then apparently test screenings were going so well, they just held it, right? Is that this film? I believe so. I'm not positive, but I feel like this is the one. All right. Or is it the other <laughs> the other film that no. we recorded a long time ago? Okay. I, I don't think it could be because that movie had already... I, I just... I think it was this one. Yeah, yeah it, 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 had to, it had to be this one. This is a film that we were like, we knew was coming... We slept on an individual screening because in the, in the past, the day after those screenings, iTunes gets it and we're like, oh, we'll just wait for it. We were doing something else that night. And then they held it for like two months. <laughs> yeah. And I missed multiples of this because the, it was screening at SF Film Festival in May. And I think it was like the day I flew out to Cannes was when the screening was or something like yeah. that. Um, so, yeah, it's been a long anticipated journey and Buzz has only kind of built and built and built over those months since we first missed it at Sundance. Yeah, much like the characters in the story, we had to check in mm-hmm. with this film over the course of many different times over the over the times that we waited for it. But for us, it was individual months. For them, maybe it was groups of twelve years. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. We we are as as we mentioned at the top of the show, we are on our third episode that we're recording, so we're not going to spend too much time in the beginning before this review. But we do want to say. Um, over the past several episodes, somewhere in there, uh, I have teased a, uh, <laughs> a a recording that we did for a little film called Return to Soul uh, that uh, we had recorded many, many months ago, and I just yeah. didn't get around to editing it, and we've been sitting on it, and then like we've had these gaps in our episodes coming out, and then whenever we got back, there were other things that were higher priority to put out, um, so... This is just, we figured now is the perfect time. Uh, This film, Past Lives, is about somebody who was born in Korea and emigrated to Canada and uh, returned to Seoul. Is about a person who was was born in Korea and then moved to somewhere else in the world. Uh, Steven's telling me that it was Paris. Uh, (laughs) This is how long it's been since I, I watched that film. Um, I believe we recorded an episode four months ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's been quite a while. Um, but, uh, you know, we figured this is, you know, probably the perfect time to finally release that episode. So it will enter the feed sometime after this review that you're currently listening to. So uh, you'll be able to hear our thoughts on that film preserved in time <laughs> from four <laughs> months ago when we actually did that recording. Um, so it'll be an interesting time capsule to, to see where we were then versus, uh, you know, where we are now, uh, even though yeah. that episode will still be a time capsule. So there'll be no connection to the current moment in time. Um, both both our movies featuring prominent time jumps, too. They are, they're going to be interesting to compare and contrast. I think tonally they are wildly different <laughs> from yeah. each other. <laughs> yeah, but... yeah. That is true. But, you know, characters have a similar origin (laughs) Mm. (laughs) story-ish. But, uh, yeah, what do you say, Stephen? We get into past lives. Can't wait. All right, we're going to take a listen to the trailer for past lives and then come back and give everyone a review. There's a word in Korean, inyon. It means providence or fate. Do you believe in that? That's just something Koreans say to seduce someone. (laughs) 
what a good story this is. Childhood sweethearts who reconnect 20 years later and realize they were meant for each other. In the story, I would be the evil white American husband standing in the way of destiny. Shut up. He was just this kid in my head for such a long time. I think I just missed him. Did he miss you? His arm! Wow, Dota. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Not really sure how to feel about it, son. And the way you move makes me feel like I can't live without you. It's the way I want to stay. Like I flew 13 hours to be here. I'm not going to tell you that you can't see him or something. 네가 한국을 떠나지 않았다면 내가 널 찾았을까? 우리가 사귀었을까? 헤어졌을까? 부부가 됐을까? 아이들을 가졌을까? 너는 나를 왜 찾았어? 한번더 보고 싶었어. If two strangers walk by each other in the street and their clothes accidentally brush it means there have been 8,000 layers of inyan between them. Want you to stay. Want you to stay. All right, so that was the trailer for Past Lives. Um, it is uh, the story of a woman who um, you know, grew up in Korea and then her family had moved to uh, Canada and she had pursued a life of a, uh, being a writer and over the years has gotten in touch with somebody who was a childhood friend, we'll say. Um, mm-hmm. And it sort of uh, checks in with her over time and we are watching pro- predominantly a period of time in which she is... Um, going to meet up with this friend from her childhood um, and see how that affects her and her current state of being. <laughs> Stephen Miller, what did you think of Past Lives? I, I love this movie so damn much. I loved it so much. I have seen it twice already mm. uh, because I first watched it uh, with friend of the show, Julius, at an early Q&A. And I loved it so much, I needed to see it again with Joanna. And also, I just deeply wanted to watch it a second time and live in the emotions of this movie. I'm going to I'm gonna try to not just like monologue a lot at the beginning, because it'll be better for us to have it back and forth. But I, <laughs> I hinted in my review of Elemental that there were some similarities between those stories. Um, Past Lives is also a story about immigration to a new city and romance and finding love um, between cultures versus across cultures. Uh, But I think, honestly, it'd be reductive to compare them too much because I don't think this movie is really about romance that much. I think this is a movie about everyone containing multitudes and the, like, all the trajectories our lives could have taken, all the the burden, right? The grief of all the possibility that we've had that we just necessarily collapsed into one decision and then commit to. Um, and I think this is really about love as like the merging of two infinite unknowable people who are choosing to try to love and understand each other, even though they never 100% will be able to um there's a moment in the movie early on when nora is telling Sung that she's heading to montauk and about five seconds after i thought it and probably every sappy cinephile in the audience thought it she goes eternal sunshine of the spotless mind <laughs> um <laughs> and i loved that moment because in my mind this is like a wistful more adult more wise counterpart to eternal sunshine's idea of love and we can we can like dive into that because i have a whole theory about it um in eternal sunshine 
Joel and Clementine, they're destined for each other. No matter what happens, they will always find each other in Montauk. No matter if they wipe out their history, their memories, whether they fought, whether things didn't work out, they're always going to recur and find each other. And they literally, like, plumb through Joel's dreams, his psyche, his everything. She's hiding in there. She is, like, destined for him. It, it is this idea of a soulmate, I feel like, in Eternal Sunshine. Like, we have to try again. We we are in love with each other. We can it can be no other way, right? Like we we are two people who have to be with each other. And in past lives, it, it's kind of the opposite. Like there there is it's in the trailer this idea of a soulmate. Like the perfect love story is Heisung, um, the person that Nora grew up with, the person who represents her old life together, who. They keep intersecting. They keep being here. And then there's this marriage on the other side between her and Arthur, played by John McGurro, um, who, like, he literally can't understand her dreams. There's, like, there's a beautiful moment that happens where they're talking about this, about how, like, she has this whole thing that he can't connect to, he can't understand, but she still makes his life bigger. And this movie is kind of about, like, the choices you make and how the choices impact who you fall in love with, who you wind up with and whether love is about fate or destiny or whether love is about like planting your roots and choosing to try to understand each other, even if you can't access everything. Um, and I just, I, I think this movie is so beautiful. I think it has so much to say about like, parallel life trajectories a lot about the immigrant experience that i can't personally speak to but it's just really really moving and lovely and then it also models this like just wonderfully non-toxic marriage too that i just found like i cried so much <laughs> watching this movie and i think it is just such a uh, a wise film about life and experience and like how much stock to put in idealism and romanticism versus how much to flow with life and accept the things you lose. And it, it's just beautiful. Um, but I want to hand it to you before I blabber any more about it and ask what you thought of this movie. Um, yeah. So, you know, when, when the trailer for this film first dropped, uh, I was kind of of two minds. I was of the mind of what whatever asshole cut this trailer together is manipulating me so hard into wanting to see this film <laughs> which was like it just it was it, like every beat of it the music choice the way it plays everything together like i was like i was like all right this seems like something i definitely need to see the other yeah. part of my brain was maybe the brain of the husband <laughs> mm. <laughs> where i'm like you're I... the jealous white guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i was like i was like ah. Oh, I am so scared about whatever it is this film is about to do because I, I'm just so, I, I just, I just don't believe that they're going to do right by the situation and, and talk about this in the way that I would want from a story of this type. Like, um, but to this film's credit, I think it did an amazing job at handling the subject matter and, you know, there are lots of films that will try to talk about what if, um, especially when it comes to ro romantic things. Um, most of those films, I think, do it terribly, or at least in a non-realistic mm -hmm. manner, right? Who you are watching is choosing decisions based on what if questions, but not with any context or anything, but based on, um, you know, just just the what if is enough to throw everything into chaos and, and make them want to, you know, you know, if they gave up something before to achieve one thing, they might want to give it up again to achieve another later down the line, you know, um, you know, maybe, maybe an example could be something like worst person in the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Some people might say I, that person isn't me. I'm just repeating things that I've heard from other people. Um, but you know, some people might say that. Um, but anyways, I, I was, I would just kind of like, man, am I going to hate this film based on choices that the story decides to make? And I think that what I got was a really beautiful film that actually sits and deals with, like, what are the choices you made to get to the point you are in in space in your life? And did you achieve everything you wanted to? 
did you not? Who have you chose to be with? Who have you chose not to be with? And kind of, it doesn't suddenly, it's not like a wrench comes in and everything, the entire world is exploded and now we're on a different plot. It's like, no, this is just one piece in the way I think about my current state in life. And it kind of, it really handles it delicately on both the side of the, you know, of, of both people in all three people in these relationships, right? Like you get to see yeah. what things mean to them, what they're holding on to, what that means for them in reality, what, how it makes them think about a potential future or futures that will never be, you know, like it, it, it kind of, it really actually has a very, very soft hand in all this stuff. And, you know, you talked about um, fate and destiny and connection. And one of the things this film puts out there and, you know, I, I will not, talk about the scenes itself or who are saying the lines of dialogue but this film introduces this uh providence connection platonically and across uh different relationships right like mm -hmm. like when in the trailer you know the audio where she was saying oh if you walk by and you and a stranger's shirt touch it means there's been like ten thousand layers of of stuff before this moment it doesn't mean that you and that person are romantically entangled now it's just there is something that guided those two moments to connect in that moment. It doesn't mean that doesn't necessarily mean anything, right? It just means yeah. that like something had to lead to that moment and that passing and that chance encounter. So it's and you know obviously I'm I'm speaking about a <laughs> something that I know nothing about from the standpoint of what the actual terminology of this uh, providence thing is, but I'm just saying that like the way the film is presenting it to me, it's 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 just about the connection there. And and it doesn't have to mean more than you let it mean, um, or it could mean as much as you want it to mean. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, I, I really loved what this film does with this sort of triangle it's setting up. And I think it handles it in a way that like didn't like I can put myself into any of the character's shoes and I feel that the film handled it. Um not not correctly but like delicately enough yeah that i feel like no matter if i draw a card that says you are this character for the duration of this film i am happy with the way things play out and i find it true to life and realistic and it feels like this film is authentic um and for that i i just really love it yeah yeah i i definitely feel the same way about the i would say it's the grace that it has for every character in this movie and it we were talking before recording about what we're even allowed to say outside of spoilers because kind of the fact that it has grace for every character could be construed as a spoiler um but i think it's an important part of what the movie is doing and there there is a love story of sorts whether platonic or romantic across time between nora or na young was her name in korea uh and Sung, and that is so it's kind of a delicate story of losing and finding someone and being separated across continents and that desire to be near each other, but then also knowing that your lives are diverging that I think is really, really lovely and well done. Um, I don't want to fall into the trap of pointing to who is clearly the third character by billing and screen time <laughs> and making him be the one I relate to the most. But like you, when I learned about the premise of this movie, I was thinking about what about the poor husband, you know? <laughs> um, and I, I do think th the movie does so right by him. And a lot of the points in this movie that make me cry, you know, or that move me the most are when Greta Lee and John Maguro are talking to each other. And maybe that's just because I'm projecting my own life and marriage and everything into this guy. And so I'm, it's easier for me to put myself in his shoes than in Sung's shoes, because Sung is, he is living a life and in a culture that is uh, to the other two different and outside, right? Like uh, yeah. Nora is even talking to Arthur, um, trying to maybe downplay um, how impactful Sung's visit has been. And she just keeps saying like, He's so Korean. He everything he does is so Korean. It it's all so Korean. Like all she can say is like this thing that is a proxy for he is this giant part of my life that you don't understand. Yeah. Um and I think the movie just does a really wonderful job of handling that and 
being about identity and about her having this level of grief and this thing that she misses and contemplating what might happen in her future. It, it, it just is such a like wonderfully sensitive movie. It, it reminded me of like the before series in that it just seems like it, it can have adult conversations and it can handle them very well. And it can trust the audience to follow the emotional thread, even if different people are disagreeing with each other um, yeah. in those conversations. And, and I think that's the key, right? It's, this is one of the most mature depictions of relationships that we get in film, like in, yeah. you know, ever, like at least in the last several years, right? Like a lot of times these romantic films are about uh, wish fulfillment or at least uh, uh, depicting a, somebody having been wronged or something, right? Like it, it's like, this is my way of getting out my feelings about it. Or this is the ideal, I you know, concept of what I think somebody how they'd want to be swept off their feet or how they'd want to be rescued from something right and i think that this film is it just paints a relationship that feels like three real life actual adults and how they think over things and i think that um you know uh you know the main character nora she she is she's in a place where she is you know she she came to where she is to achieve a specific goal which she hasn't achieved yet and she's trying to analyze where she is in life and you know she left a place to attain a thing she kind of metaphorically left that place again to mm -hmm. make sure she could attain that thing and she hasn't and it's like does she actually want the thing or does she think that because she hasn't achieved the thing that she chose over the thing is the thing something that she should have chosen? Like, it, it's all it's all just questioning where you were. And I, I think that the film, it handles all sides of the equation, if you will. <laughs> like, yeah, realistically, and, and I just keep coming back to that. Like, it feels like people having an actual conversation. And for the most part, save for one scene, I think most people are pretty on the level <laughs> at mm -hmm. all times. You know what I mean? There's one yeah, scene that can... gets a little, a little muddy. <laughs> we, we can, we, we can talk about it. I'm, I'm interested in doing at least yeah. a light spoiler section for this movie. Um, and, and like another thing I just wanted to bring up and, and you've probably thought about this too, is we've had a lot of movies lately that are multiverse movies and they're about like the, the different ways life could have gone, you know, everything everywhere all at once is the most obvious comparison. And this is kind of taking that idea too. You know, I think past lives is a clever name for this movie because it is also just literally about someone's past, but it's also about like the idea of the different lives you might have had and all the different places you could be, right? In one place, you are doing laundry and taxes with someone. And in another place, you might be living this entirely different life in an entirely different situation. And it, um, I, I don't know. I just think this is a theme that keeps recurring right now. Maybe people are imagining what other lives they could have had. And they're just thinking about all the random things that led them to where they are right now. And this is just like a big hug of a movie that says like, you are where you are. It's okay to be uncertain. Let's talk about it. And there's just a maturity to that, that I think is really, um, yeah, really, really beautiful. It's also just directed wonderfully uh Celine song has never directed a feature film she is a playwright much like uh nora the character who is very much based on her in in this movie um so sorry I, uh, not to, I, I i always interjected like a terrible time but the reason i laughed was not against anything you were saying but when you said she's a playwright there is a moment in this film where characters are talking and I was like, God damn it. If this film ends with the story we are watching is the story that she writes by the, I was going to be so pissed. Um, but that's not what happens. So yeah, it does. I, I will say without spoiling it, that I think this movie ends at exactly the perfect moment. Um, yeah. The scene where it is about to end, I'm like, do it, do it, do it, do it. And then it does it. And it is, uh, it is lovely. Yeah. <laughs> um, do, do it being, ending the film not End you're not movie. speaking End to any right particular here. character <laughs> yeah because that is what i think celine song is so good at is she just like that montauk scene where she referenced the movie the moment it was in my head like i feel like she 
knows emotionally exactly where I'm at and never doubles down or underlines it after that point. It's like yeah. the movie says just enough for you to get it and then she's out. And I think it ends at just the right moment without doubling down, without explaining it, without making it tidy or anything. It's just like, nope, you've got it. You're going to sit with this movie now. And I, yeah, I, I just really, really love this thing. There's another funny thing about like where it does end though, is because like visually beautiful. Uh, if you think about where everyone is standing <laughs> and sight lines and stuff like that, it, mm. it does add a little w weird tinge of, of stuff which is not what the film is going for um this is a small film and i think that it's just you know it's easier to lock down one block than it is <laughs> to lock down <laughs> half a city street yep interesting <laughs> we can we can talk about the final uh sequence of, of the movie i think that would be, that would yeah, be yeah. interesting yeah the, uh anything before we get to, to any you know true honest to god spoilers like I want to quote things, but I think it'd be better to just save them for spoilers and let uh, let people sit with this as our non-spoilery review. Cool. Um, well, then, on that case, uh, what do you say we get into the pre-spoiler verdicts? Sure. All right, Stephen Miller, if you were going to give us a must-see, record with a caveat, wait for until pass with a caveat, or a must-avoid, what would you give it? Easy must-see. I, I think this movie is amazing. It is moving. It is delicate and wise and just has a lot of real things to say about life and relationships and it is uh it's really really special i think for that particular blend of things uh, before midnight might be the last movie that made me feel that way it's just so rare for a movie to come along and offer you that so yeah love love this movie and of course there's so much that I don't personally understand, but I love about the immigrant experience too. And that there's a lot of stuff that I believe is specific to Korean culture as well. And it just has a, has a depth to it that I think is really, really rewarding on multiple viewings. Yeah. Uh, it's a must see for me as well. Um, I think it is a beautiful film that, you know, handles it, handles its subject matter in a way that didn't, uh, didn't make me worry for the goals of of what the story was trying to do right it's just a film that talks about relationships and in an authentic way and uh yeah i think it's impressive the way it handled uh the subject so must see from all of us um but uh yeah that was the non-spoiler part of this review we are going to close up the show now before getting into the spoilers so steven miller if people want to find you throughout the week where can they do that People can find me at twitter.com slash sdavidmiller or sdavidmiller.com. People can find me at christopherinreallife.com or twitter.com slash christopherirl. You can find the podcast over at thespoilerwarning.com where you can get a bunch of the back episodes of the show. If you want to subscribe to the show, you can do so on Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or wherever podcasts are found. If you want to know when the episodes go live, you can follow us at twitter.com slash spoilerwarning, facebook.com slash thespoilerwarning, or instagram.com slash us for the warning if you want to get a hold of us directly you can send an email to fans at the warning.com or you can use the contact form on our site music for this episode will come from a track selected from artlist.io so hopefully you are enjoying that that music is going to fade up and when that music fades out we will be in another one of our many lives uh talking about the truths and realities and uh maybe a couple individual scenes of this film so stay tuned for that see you in a moment All right, we are back. This is Spoiler Territory. It's the after part of a review of the film Past Lives. We are talking full-blown spoilers, so watch out. Uh, Steven, where should we get started? I don't know the right place to start spoiling. I mean, let's just rip off the Band-Aid and say the thing that neither of us going into this movie knew was whether this would be a love story between Nora and Haesung. <laughs> Yeah. That ultimately ends with them getting together and maybe Arthur just steps aside as like a Nicholas Sparks side character might do or something. <laughs> like a like a um, house falls on him? What do you <laughs> not no, more more like he recognizes that there's something special there and um 
I, I don't know. Uh, like there, there was a world where this was a love story that was complicated and messy because she's already married. Yeah, um, I haven't seen all the Nicholas Spark stuff, but I feel like the the other guy always dies or gets arrested or true. is taken out of the picture, not of his own it volition. Definitely helps. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely helps when they die. Yeah. Um, but this movie isn't doing that. And honestly, maybe I was watching it from one lens, um, but I didn't even for a second as the movie was unfolding, believe it was going to do that. It felt very clear very early on that Nora and Arthur have a really lovely marriage. <laughs> um, <laughs> and honestly, Nora and Sung, it is a romance, you know, especially the long distance relationship of sorts that they have 12 years um, into the movie. It definitely is about the the difficulty of that. And there's so much of a desire to be with each other and then a desire to see the world but Sung just doesn't, to me, seem like a a person who is threatening their relationship. He is more the idea of her history and the life she could have had and whether that sends her into a kind of identity crisis that Arthur can't access. I, I never felt like this was really a love triangle, basically. It felt like um, Sung is a catalyst for them to examine the different parts of Nora and whether she's happy with where she is. And I thought it was just, um, I don't know, really, uh, really lovely the way that they handled it. And some of my favorite moments in this movie are uh, home conversations that Nora and Arthur are having. Um, first yeah. there are, there's a thing I've noticed that Alamo or just SF in general, where anytime a movie is like predominantly non-English language, I feel like the audience laughs too much. Like they just want everything to be a comedy <laughs> so much in a way that feels condescending. <laughs> um, yeah. And like this time around, um, there's a, a sequence where Arthur is like brushing his teeth or Nora is brushing her teeth. They're getting ready and they're talking about her day. And he is clearly like, a little maybe not even hurt he's just like he's stuck on this thing that is happening and my audience was laughing a bunch to me it wasn't a very comedic scene it was very much like just a real like what do you do with this yeah um that it's just so like well acted and well done um but in that like they have this conversation where he's basically trying to interrogate like are you happy and he says something that was like my first real like tear jerky moment in this movie, which is like, you make my life so much bigger and I'm not sure if I do that for you. Yeah. And that was just such a like beautiful way to like say that he feels threatened without making it be like ownership or something. It's more about like, what am I giving you if I can't access this whole part of your life, like this language that you dream in? Um, yeah, I just, I, I just thought all of that was so beautifully done. Yeah, it, it's there's like half of me is like give him the husband of the year award, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Just because he is so understanding, but also that understanding is coming from a place of, of like fear and. Um, word is escaping me but like he's insecure about his situation and he is doing the calculation of like as you said like what what can he offer her that she yeah. wouldn't be able to have from this other person he's never he's never flipping tables he's never like you know bursting out about it he's just kind of like this resigned laughter <laughs> like when when he talks yeah. about how great the story is is going to be like it it's hilarious because mm -hmm. it's like He's making a joke of it, but that is that is the classic. I'm going to make a joke about this thing so that I can uh, be okay <laughs> with something that is clearly yeah. not making me okay right now. Well, to me, that's like the the wise adult aspect of this movie is yeah. it's just like they get things out in the open. They talk about the fact that this is messy and um, yeah. ironic and complicated, and they have that kind of. Um, comfort with each other that they can just be brutally honest and be like hey let's you know check the foundations of this marriage that we have like how are you feeling <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Do, you know i don't own you forever can 
let's just acknowledge that this is a weird situation. Yeah. And I, that was when I really knew I was in good hands. I was like, this movie's not going to let me down emotionally. This movie is going to be um, very delicate in how it handles things, which a lot goes to Greta Lee, honestly, who is the one character who she's basically maybe literally in every scene of this movie or almost except for some of the cutaways in soul when Tao Yu is with his friends, you know, drinking. Yeah. Um, and she has to believably have this intimacy and comfort with John Magaro's husband character and also have this kind of, um, like she says, not necessarily attraction, but just like, um, this like gravitational pull towards Tao Yu as like, everything that he represents and how much she wants to still be a part of that. And she manages to make both of those set like pairwise relationships and feel so real. Yeah. Um, and then when they all come together in the end, that is my favorite part of the movie, which maybe we can talk about. Yeah. Next. I, I will, before we get to the end, the end, end, I will say that pasta dinner was excruciating. <laughs> <laughs> Like I loved it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, like obviously we knew we were coming back to that because that is like the opening to the film is like basically audience surrogates literally trying to assume what they think this film is going to turn into mm -hmm. by the end, and then you're sitting there and like you know once again husband of the year is just trying to play along and be like yeah we'll go out to dinner it'll be cool we can all chat about like what stuff is good. And then just like when he's sitting on the other side of his wife and she has turned just in this two person conversation separate from him, I was like, oh, and also here's the big question. He knows way more Korean than he gives off, right? Maybe. It, it, he, it, it's not clear or he might just know a few key words and phrases that he can latch I mean, on to. Some really key words are his name. <laughs> Which, mm -hmm. even if they were saying, you know, his name in Korean, he's been with the fam. Like, he he would have adopted that as his name with the family. Or, you know, like, I, I have a feeling that mm -hmm. he's heard his name in Korean before. Yeah. And then, the, like, the amount of times they say the Providence thing, like, like he knows, like, it's almost better if he knows more Korean. Because if he knows less, all he's hearing is him uh, meant to be... Uh, <laughs> Like, <laughs> but maybe, maybe he's really not listening. Like to me, and th and this no, is where I know this is a. He's a hundred percent listening because there are some shots <laughs> that are over both of their shoulders, and it's him, like him, a little blurry in the background. It's, looking. it's, it's yeah. like if this was the office, he would be looking at the camera. <laughs> you know what I mean? See, it, it it's funny because I um, maybe you know it's just because I'm giving him the husband of the year award, but like <laughs> in my head. Because, okay, th this movie is very specific and personal, and it's about, you know, immigration from Korea to Canada to the U.S. and of, like, particular heritage she has. But for anyone, like, even in my life, you know, um, there are times where maybe I'm out with Joanna and someone from her past, like an old friend or something like that. I know there's going to be the moment where the two of them have a lot to talk about, and I can either hover over or just be happy to give space, you know? And yeah, in my know. head, he, he is, um, I'm sure he still is like m feeling bad about the fact that he can't access, like there's this rapport that they have that he can't dig into because he isn't Korean. Like the, the language of her dreams, he can't be a part of, you know? Yeah. Um, but I just, in that moment, I don't project him as being, like, frustrated. In my head, he's like, this is going to be a good story one day. And he's kind of zooming out and um, finding yeah. humor in it. I didn't think it was frustrated. But there's definitely a a awkward worry. Of, like, the, the, like, just the fact in that opening shot where those people are like, all right, they are married. And he's mm -hmm. their American friend. <laughs> <laughs> they were visiting and stuff Their like tour guide <laughs> yeah there is, there is an aspect to that whole thing that was just like man like even if he like it's I, I still think it's almost better if he is perfectly fluent in korean because then he's not only hearing the few words he knows which makes that conversation seem way more deep and romantic <laughs> You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Then before, like, it's just, it's just, it was just a funny moment that I was like watching that and being like, man, and he's got to just sit there 
and do his own thing and then sign that bill at the end of the night and call it a day. <laughs> I do love like there's that moment where he's like, we should do it again. Like, <laughs> I don't think he said that, but it was like I... that sort of feeling where he's like, I'm so glad you showed up in our lives and just <laughs> see. Oh, oh, it's so funny because that's one of my favorite moments because I take it 100 percent sincerely. Like there are a few lines in that whole uh, restaurant and then bar and then yeah. saying goodbye moment. Part of it, a lot of it is when Sung and Nora are talking together. And what Sung says, which I think is just like, like one of the chef's kiss, like summaries of the movie is, I'm going to paraphrase it, but he's like, when I was a little kid, I loved you. And I loved you because you are who you are. And who you are is someone who leaves, which means I could never be with you. Because if you stayed, you wouldn't be the thing that I find so magnetic about you, which is that you chase your dreams, you hunt after this, you are someone who can't be contained by my home. And he also, he says something about, like, I didn't know liking your husband would hurt this much. Yeah, yeah. Which I think is just like, that is really where he... If only Arthur could understand all that. Like, I do want my headcanon now to be that Arthur can hear all of it. Yeah. Um, because it is such, like, a loving... Um, you know, it, it isn't really clear to me by the end of the movie that he came to New York thinking he had a chance with her. To me, it's more like he needed to understand this loose thread in his life before he could fully commit to the marriage that he was going to enter into. And this is like a <laughs> expedition <laughs> to understand like his past or what he's missing. <laughs> I mean, that, that still make, that still puts him on shaky ground, right? It's mm. like, he's looking for an excuse sort of. Um, mm. But I think, yeah, I think where they are at by the end of it, just the understanding that both the men characters have in this of just being like, they know exactly what the other person is. They know the importance of the other person. And there's like a, there's an acceptance to it. And yeah. like, I, I do generally like the moment where he like, he's like you and me, like when he first, when he starts by like, do you, do you know about this whole destiny thing? And I was mm -hmm. like, what the fuck are you about to say? And then he's like, <laughs> I think you and I, you and I have that. And I was like, okay, thank God. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and that's why, like, right after that is when Arthur says, like, I'm really glad you came here. It was the right thing to do. Yeah. And in my mind, and my audience did, like, laugh a, a little bit there. So they kind of saw it as the, like, ooh, what an awkward third wheel type of thing to be happening. But to me, it was so sincere because to me, what Arthur is thinking is, like, you are a part of my wife's story and she misses that part of her story. And I'm glad because it made me understand her better because you came and gave us a chance to like dig deeper. So I took it completely earnestly. I think like he is just, um, all of them are like, feel like they're better because now they understand more about who they are to each other. Yeah. Well, it's also like the, the, the reason why, the question of what if is such a like impactful thing is because for most people you can never test it it's a thing that will mm -hmm. always sit around and you will always wonder and getting like being able to have closure of whatever type you can or at least understand that like yes i have a thought of this thing that i think could have been but like in reality n like if she moved home she still wouldn't be the writer she wants to be you know she right. she would be with him but like none of the questions they're having on their little like pseudo dates are about like what he does for a living and stuff so it's not mm -hmm. like she's excited about a life she could have over there it's just the idea of it and i think that him coming having those questions and maybe if he understands more korean that he let on and he heard mm -hmm. your favorite line about like the thing that i love about you is this thing that proves that i can't be with you yeah. um whereas for arthur you are someone who stays which is like the double the double whammy yeah um but yeah i'm just i'm just saying it's it's i i regret to inform you that i think you just invented uh the netflix reality show the ultimatum <laughs> <laughs> um 
but I, I totally agree. I mean, this this movie is a chance to test that what if hypothesis. And it, I, I don't know, again, that it's like a what if. It, it is kind of a what if I had been with him, but I think it's more what if I had never left Korea? You know, yeah. what? who would I be right now? What would my life be? And it isn't at all clear that she would be happy. because There's a moment when they're in... Um, they're in Brooklyn, probably like Dumbo, like they're by the bridge or something in the um, uh, carousel. And Nora is talking to him and she's saying, like, my husband and I fought here a lot before, but it isn't a bad thing. It's just like when two trees are being planted in the same pot, it like takes a while for their roots to grow. And I'm sure even her and Sung like, if they had actually gotten together, their roots would have had to grow and they would have fought, you know? Yeah. And I think the, um, there's when Arthur and Nora are talking to each other and he's feeling kind of, um, insecure or shaken. He talks about like, what if someone else had been in Montauk instead? Like what if some other artist had been there too, who also read your favorite books and also needed someone to help with rent in New York, <laughs> you know, and could have yeah. gotten you a green card. And I think what the movie is saying is like, yeah, I might've been with him. Like I might've had a completely different life, but it doesn't matter because that moment of meeting isn't what defines their love. It's the, the thing they built and struggled to grow over the 12 years since then. Yeah. And, um, that is why I think this is the antithesis of Eternal Sunshine is because every time you go to Montauk, you might have met a completely different person, and that's fine because it's the history you build together that matters, not some, like, innate fate that means, like, this is why you are together. Um, I mean, I, I love Eternal Sunshine. Don't get me wrong. I, yeah. I just think they're really interesting to think about <laughs> well, yeah, next it, to each other. It's, it's like in this, it's like the the fate piece is just the chance encounter and everything that you have is whatever work you put into building that thing. And yeah. we have all had a thousand different fate moments that we did nothing with, but we chose mm -hmm. the ones that we did choose and we built something based on that. And we will continue to have thousands of these weird fate moments, but they don't, yeah. they only mean as much as the effort that we put into cultivating them. Yeah, and you won't always fully understand someone else. Like, you're two individuals coming together. And I think the immigration story widens that. Like, it's funny to compare this to Elemental, I know. But, like, in Elemental, <laughs> Wade completely fucks up, even though the movie turns it around in, like, two minutes. Because he tries to dive in and tell Ember what to do with her life. And he's wrong, because he can't understand where she's coming from like it, it, he doesn't have a right to do that yeah and i think arthur is like the opposite of that where it's like you by necessity have this whole history that i can't ever presume to own or be a part of that makes you who you are and it's wonderful that it makes you who you are and that you are not me and i'm not you but i'm gonna try to learn korean like i'm gonna try to push the border a little bit. I'm going to try to get in there as much as I can. And you're going to try to understand me as much as you can. And their whole lives are just like going to be trying to get closer and closer. And I am, um, there's something I just really, really love about that. That feels like a truth about relationships. that movies don't talk about a lot yeah. <laughs> where they want to make it be about just the chance encounter as if that were the important thing when I think that is the least important part of any relationship. Yeah, like most most films are about the moment where somebody makes the big decision and then the rest mm. of all the happiness is assumed. And this film is focused on the building of a relationship and the maintaining of a relationship in a way that yeah. is like, yeah, most films are either the start of a relationship or the end of a relationship and this is the entire space in between those. And maybe mm -hmm. the entire space in between many lives in the past. <laughs> And exactly. future. <laughs> okay, my my last spoilery question to you. I don't I don't know if I want to frame it as a why do you think or how did you feel. Um, so insert one of those phrases when I say when Nora cries at the very end when she goes back to Arthur. How did it make you feel? And or what do you feel like the movie's trying to say? 
Um, I mean, I think it's a... I don't think she knows why she's crying. Hmm. I think it is just a a release of emotion and it's like that trip is done she will probably never see him again i think that for her it's just to like the entire last you know however long he's been there all of that just getting released all at once and kind of just going away i don't think that she like, I don't think it means a specific thing to her. I think it's just the mm-hmm. uncontrolled emotion that she was holding in the last 30 seconds, the last three days, the last 12 years. Like, all of that is just out right now. And it's just, it's kind of emotional exhaustion a little bit and kind of just mm-hmm. acceptance, maybe. Um, but yeah. What, what do you think? I think, well, first, how I felt was the first time I watched it, this was when the waterworks happened. Like, the whole rest of the movie, I was, like, feeling it, but the movie was, like, keeping me right on the edge of actually crying, and this was, like, the release valve of, okay, you can all cry now. Yeah. Um, in in terms of what it means, I think I agree with you mostly. It's just kind of like a uh, a release of the emotion of everything that has been happening. I think if she's crying for anything in particular, it is about that little girl who didn't necessarily have a choice to leave, but who was made to leave and not feeling bad for her or missing her necessarily, but just something about like the, the other lives that she didn't have. And you always, I think they say early in the movie, like, um, you lose things, but you gain other things in the process. And I think she's crying about the things that she lost, even if she's happy for what she gained. Yeah. And so like, to me, she's not crying about Sung at all. I just don't feel like the movie has built it up where she could possibly have a strong romantic connection to him yeah. by then. I feel like she's crying for her, her history and the idea of a life in Korea that she'll never know now what it, what it would have been. Yeah. So, so that was one thing that was a little bit, confusing to me like i know it was her parents that were causing them obviously because of freaking mm-hmm. you know eight-year-old kid can't decide yeah. that they're gonna move to another country uh but she always had goals that she thought required her to be outside of korea and there was an aspect of the film that i didn't fully understand how like even in the scene where she's talking about how korean he he was I kind of read that as her dancing around other words that might be more, uh, Mm -hmm. less receptive to her husband. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and, and I, I just thought that was like a catch all word for like, what's like the least, the least triggering word that I could say in this moment right now. A hundred percent. It is. Yeah. A hundred percent. I just think, I think she is being honest when she says, cause he asks her, do you find him attractive? And she's like, I don't think, so it's like i don't it's just a lot it's just he's so (laughs) korean that i Mm. want to jump his bones (laughs) (laughs) um but no in all seriousness i i I just i didn't i didn't fully understand that she was holding on to like let's pretend arthur was like hey i just got a job opportunity in korea like i like you're my roots i could live anywhere do you want to move to korea I, even if even in that situation, I don't know that being in Korea gets her anything other than close to her family, right? Um, so I, no, well, I mean, it does. She still is someone who left, right? She would still be a person who is no longer of that culture. That like that's the return to soul conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So it's just to me, I didn't like the idea of longing for a her that would have stayed. It's not that I don't believe that is true it's that i don't know what that looks like i I can't understand that longing from her point of view because she has taught me through all the check-ins with her that she doesn't have a connection that obviously she left when she was Mm -hmm. so young and that's maybe part of the problem but i guess i i was missing the longing for that connection um yeah but was there a scene where she talked about her korean being rusty when she first meets up with yeah. him? Okay. So, yeah, because she only ever speaks Korean with her mom and with him on, yeah, on um, Skype. 
Yeah. And even that I couldn't tell yeah. if it was like she wished that she had more people to speak Korean with or if she just doesn't do it any like I, I don't know. I I, I kinda Yeah. I did I didn't know how important it was for her to have a connection to her Koreanness. Yeah, I did it, it's hard for me to say to you probably because I I haven't lived it. I'm sure it's a both yeah, and yeah. you know, um probably also there's just something about remembering who you were when you were eight or nine years old and how idealistic you were and how simple you thought your life was going to be and there's a part of you that looks at your tiny east village apartment and your you know attempt to get a play off the ground and remembering how you thought your life was going to go and just feeling um i don't know just like missing the simplicity of it i yeah i'm not sure and then i don't want to end on a non-serious note but I did tease something earlier before we got into spoilers. Just the idea of like I I really like I really like the him just being there to like hold mm -hmm. her when she comes back and she breaks down. Um but there is a weird like did he just be like I'm just going to uh, I I could use a cigarette right now. I'm going to go stand on the porch mm. so that I can watch whatever. You know like it didn't feel like like it'd be one thing if they were on the other side of the building and he was just sitting on the fire escape and then she came out and crawled out on the fire escape with him and then started crying. But like, yeah, he came down to the street. <laughs> I know. I, I, I get you. You I've decided because their relationship is so wonderful that he is out there to be ready for her, but he has not turned his head to look at them at all because he trusts them. Yeah, yeah. But it, you're right. It, Visually speaking, the blocking makes it. Yeah, it, in the context of the muddy. film, I trust it. I trust it. I trust him mm -hmm. that he was literally just walking out and maybe didn't even expect her to be home for a long time. But like, mm -hmm. it, there was just a funny aspect. Like, it felt like a like a, a visual gag you'd see in something where it's like you think they're just a mile away and it turns out they're just like right in front of the house and <laughs> he's just been sitting there the whole time like at dinner. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have two other thoughts and then I'm probably tapped out of thoughts. One is that that scene is one of two really great kind of long take tracking shots. That one is kind of a side scroller, you know, um, as... Greta Lee, who is phenomenal in this, by the way, I probably didn't say that enough. Um, yeah, yeah. She basically has to like contain all this emotion while she's just silently walking back home. And then another is when uh, Nora and Sung are walking through a park and their conversation begins with the camera just kind of like looking at them at a distance. And then the camera's like scanning through bushes and we can't even see them. And then it ends with them close up. And there's just a really... um. I don't know. The movie has a lot of really good, like the before series, like long shots of just people walking and talking that I that I dug a lot. Um, the second thing I wanted to say, which is that I'm a, you know, white American who grew up in Southern California and lives in Northern California. So I cannot speak at all to the immigrant experience. But I think like the idea of having something that was a part of you that you don't even know if you miss or how your life would have gone, but you still feel something about. For me, that is probably like growing up in the church and religion is like, I remember when I see depictions of like people at a church camp or worship music or like the feeling of that, I remember who I was when I was there. And I think like, what would my life have been if I had gone, continued in that direction instead yeah. of, you know, going up to Berkeley and becoming corrupted by the world or whatever narrative <laughs> you want. And like, I, I don't want that other life, but there's still a little part of me that like thinks about that kid and how far I am from him. But, um, yeah, I don't know that, that is my feeble attempt to connect to something that I can't totally there, connect to. There's still a, there's still a non zero chance that, uh, this podcast would have still happened. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Yeah. <laughs> because nothing about the change in trajectory <laughs> removed that our our providence from happening. Yes. Uh Chris is one of the few people uh who is not related to me who was in my life for both of those <laughs> faces. <laughs> we just happened to board the same train, so you came to San Francisco with me. And if I had yeah. you, maybe <laughs> you wouldn't have either. That that is that is very true. Um but yeah. Now we need to make a version of this movie where you, me, Joanna, and Jamie are sitting in a bar and everyone's like, the guys are just talking to each other. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> are they? <laughs> yep. Anyway. <laughs>
All right. Um, yeah, I think I think that's probably <laughs> I think that's I think probably we it. it for this episode. Um, yeah. Thanks everybody for listening, and uh, we'll see you in our next. Re- well, technically, we'll see you in a review we recorded four months ago. But then after that, we'll be mm-hmm. back for more more uh, contemporary films. <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye. Bye.